Well, I was going to preach, but Miss Pat preached it. <laughs> the lyrics to those songs, that was Philippians 3, and that's what I was preaching on. Thank you so much, Miss Pat. Yeah, everything else counts as nothing in this world. But to know Jesus, that's everything. That's everything in this life. And that's what she was singing about. And I, I just say amen. I, uh, I was sitting there last night and I had uh, uh, text start coming over Cheryl's phone. Because I'm not a Facebook guy, but a lot of, a lot of you are. And, and uh, my wife's a Facebook junkie. And so uh, she says, hey, it's one of your old friends that you used to hang around with way, way back many years ago when we were young. And I said, oh, really? And so I started texting him back and forth with him. And uh, I don't know, I'm sure this has happened to most of you, and it happened to me. I was pretty wild and crazy as a young man. Can you believe that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and he was one of the ones that I ran around with a lot. And, and so we were texting back, catch, catching, catching up on each other and everything. And he was like, well, what are you doing now? And all this. And I said, well, when I got to the part where I, I took over as a teaching pastor here for the last two months, I've been the teaching pastor here, uh, the texting stopped. I'm like, Boy, there we go again, you know, because when, when you lived that life before and God has taken you to a, another place with him, all your old friends don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. Has that happened to you guys? Yes. Uh, you guys that have lived uh, long enough have seen that happen. And, and you know, you think, well, why is that? Why, why don't they understand that? But they don't because they're still out there in the world, you know. And uh, so, uh, do we say, oh, well, it was fun, Lord, but I'm going back to that place. Have any of you ever done that, gone back after you've moved on with the Lord or tried to? How well does that work out? It doesn't. Let me, let me tell you, because I tried it for a little while. And guess who chases you? God does. He won't let you. He won't let you. Uh, so... Uh, that indwelling Holy Spirit keeps telling you, what are you doing? What are you doing? And so, okay, Lord, I get it. So, <clears throat> anyway, we're in Philippians 3. Uh, we're going to cover 1 through 11 today. Uh, so if you guys would stand for the reading of God's Word, we'll go ahead and get started. In verse 1, Chapter 3, Philippians. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Don't forget that word. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Five, uh, uh, I'm sorry, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You may be seated. 
Lord God, uh, uh, as we dig into your word, Lord, help us to learn today. Help us to grow in your word, Lord. Help us to see what you would have us to see and to understand what you would have us to understand, Lord. I pray that your word would go through, uh, forth through my mouth, Lord, that uh, everything that comes out of my mouth, Lord, would be from you and not from me, Lord. Uh, just use me as your vessel this morning. In your, in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, so let's start, start dissecting this. In verse 1 it says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. That's odd that Paul would say that, uh, that it's, it's safe for you. First he says, finally, which is an indication that something's going to change, like he's getting ready to say one more thing and, and that's it, that, that he's not going to say anything else. This is the final word on it, but uh, that's not true. It's just... In, in the Greek, it's he's changing directions. He's changing gears, if you will. He's going to talk about something different. I was looking at this uh, stuff, and, and uh, I was reading some things, and uh, uh, one of the commentators happened to say, he said, when a, when a young boy asks his father, what, it mean, what, it, what does it mean, father, when, when the pastor says, finally, what does that mean? And he says, absolutely nothing, son. It means nothing. So, <clears throat> with Paul, it means he's changing gears. It's a signal that he's moving on to other matters. Uh, this does not mean he, that this is the last thing he has to say. Uh, so, well, the first thing he comments on is, he says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. How many, <clears throat> excuse me, in in the first chapter of Philippians and the second chapter of Philippians that we covered, uh, what was one of the main themes he kept going over and over was rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And he says it again here. He says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. And then he goes on to say, uh, it's safe for you to do that. So... When Paul says rejoice in the Lord, what's he talking about? He, does he just want you to, to smile and be happy, that, you know, that, uh, be happy for Jesus or whatever? No, no. Rejoicing is not an emotion. Get that. Rejoicing is an activity that we choose to do. We choose to do. Don't forget that. It's a choice, and it's not an emotion. It's something that we do. Okay. He says, oh, let, me, let me back up. Uh, the times that Paul tells us to rejoice, are those usually times of happy times on the mountaintops? No, no. When Paul tells us to rejoice, it's usually in a time of suffering. And if you look back through Paul's life through the scripture, you'll see a lot of the times that he's rejoicing, he's rejoicing in prison or he's rejoicing uh, in in. Uh, all, all types of persecution that he's gone through. He's rejoicing in it. And you, and you think, how can he possibly rejoice in it? Why, how is that possible? Uh, you know, you would think he would be sad and, and uh, uh, downtrodden and defeated. But no, he's rejoicing. How is that? How can he do that? But we, yet we see it over and over in Scripture. Well, it has nothing to do with being, being happy all the time can you be happy all the time no that's not nobody can be happy all the time happy is an emotion okay this is something much deeper rejoicing in the Lord true rejoicing is being thankful all the time have a spirit of thankfulness for God's provision uh, it, in his infinite wisdom he's given us this opportunity to choose to rejoice we don't have to walk around and uh, despair and disgust and complaining about everything all the time uh, when things go bad. Everybody, I mean every one of us, are going to walk through tribulation. Has that been your experience so far? Yeah, it doesn't change. It's going to continue on the rest of your life as a believer, okay? Uh, I hate to say it, and I, like I say every Sunday, it's, it sounds like a Debbie Downer for me, but 
that's the Christian life. It, we are not guaranteed that rose garden existence, you know, where we just have everything perfect all the time. That's just, that's the only time that's going to happen is when we get to heaven, okay? Uh, so rejoicing is a choice. Uh, and when we rejoice, it means that we, were, we are choosing not to do something else because God has wired us to where you're either rejoicing or you're not, okay? If you're bitter and you're complaining about everything and you're resentful about everything, you can't rejoice at the same time because that's not how you're wired. You, you have one or the other, and it's a choice. All right. It's by God's design. So, if we're rejoicing, we can't be complaining at the same time. Uh, what comes out of our mouth is an indicator of what is going on in our hearts. So, when Paul is rejoicing, his heart is right with God. He is rejoicing because his heart is right with God. Okay, that's where we need to focus. Because whatever our, whatever our heart, whatever, whatever is going on in our heart comes out in our mouth. You guys know that, right? You know, if you're bitter or resentful or, or you're, you're having a really rough time with things, and that tends to spew out of your mouth. But Paul is telling us here, he says, you get to choose. You get to choose to rejoice in these, these hard, difficult times. And it's an attitude of the heart where the, all of this begins, okay? It's in your heart, and then that trans, translates to your words. What's in your heart translates to your words. Look at Matthew uh, <clears throat> chapter 15. Verse 18 through 20. It says, uh, but what comes out of the mouth, this is Jesus speaking, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defiles a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. So if we have evil thoughts in our hearts, these thoughts find their way into our words, okay? So we need to focus on the heart first and make sure our heart is right with God. Luke, Luke 6, verse 43, it says, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor, again, does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. All right? This is a great thing for us. All right? So if we focus our efforts on rejoicing in God and his provision, uh, we are at the same time guarding against those things that rob us of joy. Okay, did you get that? You can't be robbed of joy if you're focusing on rejoicing in the Lord. Okay? Uh, the enemy would like to have it the other way, but it just doesn't happen. When you're rejoicing in the Lord, you are guarding against those things that take that joy from you. Okay? That's why Paul in this verse talks about Rejoicing in the Lord is keeping you safe. It's a safeguard. It's a safeguard against what? What I just told you. It's a, a defense against it. Choosing to rejoice in the midst of hardship is the single greatest defense from the things that make us turn away from God. Okay? That makes sense? It's a defense against the things that make us turn away from God. All right. It's impossible to grumble and complain when you're rejoicing. Right. All right. So what happens when you choose not to rejoice? OK. What creeps into your life? Fear, doubt, double mindedness, double mindedness, discouragement. These things creep into your life when you choose not to rejoice and you are that other person. These things creep into your life and. It's, like a, it's like, almost like an automatic thing. Uh, your heart attitude changes, and these things manifest in your words as well. Uh, that's a barometer. That helps you to know when your focus is shifting away from the Lord and onto other things. That helps you to know. And it comes out in your mouth, all right? 
So we need to spend time rejoicing in the Lord, spending time in prayer, fellowshipping with other believers, and serving our Lord. That needs to be our focus. And when we step away from that, we get those attitudes of fear, doubt, double-mindedness, double-mindedness discouragement. Those things creep into our life. Okay, uh, How does that happen? Or why does that happen? It does because we're stepping away from what Jesus talks about in John 15. Basically what it is is we stop abiding in him. This is one of Jason's favorite verses. He quotes it all the time. But we get all tangled up when we don't abide in him. Jesus says, abide in me and I will abide in you. Okay, But that, that's, that's a personal responsibility of ours. We need to continue abiding in him. Okay, What does it mean? Let me read you the verse first. He's, in John 15 it says, uh, verse 3, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He's talking about Jesus. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what? Nothing, right? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Abide in this passage is a verb. It translates, uh, translates, you can tell I'm from South Texas, translates, <laughs> it translates to staying in a given place, staying in a state or a relationship or uh, in expectancy, to continue to dwell, to endure, to be present, to remain, to stand, or to tarry, all right? So that means staying in that place. Abiding is staying in that place. Don't drift away from Jesus, all right? He's there, but we drift. He doesn't drift, we drift, right? And the longer we stay away from that spiritual influence in our lives, which is the Holy Spirit, the easier it is to stay away. Has that been your, uh, uh, what you found to be true? Yes, me too. It's easier to stay away once you've stayed away for a while. Pretty soon we get to that place where we never intended to be. But it happens. And what happened? We fail to continue to abide in Him. So, Paul says, your safeguard, your, what keeps you safe is this rejoicing in the Lord, rejoicing in Him. Do that thing, and you won't have that tendency to drift from abiding in Him, okay? Verse 2 says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Sounds like Paul's talking about three different groups of people, doesn't it? But he's only talking about one group of people called Judaizers. He's saying, look out for the Judaizers. Look out for the Judaizers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh, which are Judaizers. So what's the big deal? Well, in that culture, in that, in that day, there were those going around, and they called them Judaizers because they came from Judea, and they were preaching a false gospel. And they were saying, you need to do these things, not just salvation through faith, but you need to do these other things in order to be saved, in order to go to heaven. And one of those things was, uh, well, I'll just read it to you. Uh, Acts 15, verse 1 says, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. I can't stress this, isn't, this enough. This is false doctrine. It is false teaching. And Paul was saying, look out for these guys. They're dogs, and they're going to lead you down the wrong path. And he says, be careful of them, because what they're preaching is what we call Jesus plus something else for salvation. Okay? There is no something else. Either you have your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and you are a believer and that's it, or you're believing a false doctrine, Jesus plus something else. And uh, Paul is saying, no, don't go down that road. That is the wrong road to go down. 
he says, uh, <clears throat> by going down that road, uh, these false teachers were actually diminishing and outright denying the sufficient work of Christ. What Christ did on the cross was enough. It is finished. He even said that from the cross. It is finished. There is nothing else for the believer to understand and to re receive into his heart through faith. But that, that's it. But yet... These Judaizers are saying, oh, no, you have to be circumcised. You have to follow the law of Moses, the Levitical law, and all of that, uh, plus Jesus. Yeah, that part, too. And Paul's saying, no, no, that's wrong. Don't do that. Let's see what Jesus said to, had to say about it. Matthew 23, verse 15. He says, woe to you. Now, this is our Lord speaking. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Because you travel around on sea and land to make one convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. So instead of leading people to the Lord through salvation, they're driving people away, okay? Because they're laying all this other stuff on them. Uh, he says, uh, these guys will spiritually harm you. They will spiritually harm you. It's dangerous to listen to what they're saying. When they said Jesus is not enough, they're putting stuff on you that never should be put on you. It's a spiritual burden, and they will not have pity on you. This is an interesting statement that I, I was reading in a commentary that just really sums it up really well. It says, legalism, which is what these Judaizers are preaching, basically, is a form of legalism, where you have to follow the law to the letter and what Jesus did is, yeah, that's, that's one thing, but you've got to do this as well. This legalism, uh, this commentator says, legalism makes someone's opinion your obligation. It makes someone's tradition your burden. Let me read that again. Legalism makes someone's opinion your obligation. It makes someone's tradition your burden. So they're putting all this stuff on the people that's unnecessary. And then when they find that they can't keep those traditions or they can't keep those obligations, what happens? They fall away because they think, oh, I just can't be a Christian. I can't do this. It's, well, of course you can. It's impossible. Nobody can. But Jesus, nobody can. So he says, don't, don't allow these Judaizers to put that on you because that's not, that's not necessary. All right. Where are we? Verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So zero confidence in the flesh. The flesh will get you nowhere. Verse 4 through 6 says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh... This is Paul speaking. He says, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law, a Pharisee as to zeal, a persecutor of the church as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Okay. So why is Paul boasting about the, his uh, fleshly accomplishments? He's, he's putting it out there saying, look, and he's already told us this over and over. He said, don't do this because that stuff has no value anymore. He says, the only thing is to seek the Lord. That's it. Just seeking the Lord and his glory and his righteousness. He says, but, but this other stuff, it has no value. But he's saying, if anyone could boast in that stuff, it would be me because this is my past and this is my background. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I even so, was such a zealot that I hunted Christians. And took them and imprisoned them. He says, I'm a, I'm a, uh, uh, I followed the Levitical law. I did the, uh, I'm the, uh, born a son uh, of the descendant of Benjamin from the tribe of Judah. He's like, I've got all the credentials, guys. But that stuff doesn't mean anything. It means nothing. And <clears throat> he says it's not worth boasting about. So forget about it. He says, uh, 
There's really nothing boast, uh, worth boasting about other than being found in Christ with a righteousness that comes through faith in God. That's the only thing we can boast about, okay? Just that and that alone. When you look at the Greek in this particular verse uh, where he talks about this, he says, in the Greek it translates, but if I was going to boast, it would be this. That's what, what it means. And, he, of course, he's not boasting. He's just making a point. That's all. Letting other people know his credentials, which he says are worthless to him now. They mean nothing to him. Uh, he has impeccable credentials, but they mean nothing. So, when we look at these verses, he's saying, don't put any confidence in the flesh, period. Don't do it. Don't show off your accomplishments. They mean nothing. He's willing to give them all up in exchange for knowing Christ. Okay, that's where we need to be. Do we have lists? worldly list of accomplishments I bet in this room we would have a lot of worldly accomplishments but Paul is saying they don't mean anything anymore they don't mean they're you're gonna leave all that stuff here whether it's worldly goods whether it's accolades from the world all of that stuff stays here how many people do you know that lived a hundred years ago that they had all these things titles behind their name or whatever that are completely in obscurity now nobody remembers I mean you say well oh, man if they were in a history book or something I might remember but nobody really remembers so what does all of that matter what, is, what does it matter in the long run it means nothing it means absolutely nothing and that's the point Paul is making here Would you or would I give up everything or have we given up everything to follow Christ? That's something we need to ask ourselves. It doesn't minimize the things, the titles behind our name or the amount of things we have in this world. It doesn't minimize. Those things are still there, but, but our attitude toward those things has changed as a believer. We say that stuff doesn't matter anymore. You remember the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and asked how how he could have a shot at going to heaven or how he could uh, have eternal life. Remember what Jesus told him? He said, sell all that you have and give it to the poor, then come follow me. Sell all that you have and give it to the poor, come follow me. So did Jesus put high value on the things of the world? No, no. He could care less about the things of the world. Did the rich young ruler uh, follow Jesus? No, he didn't. We don't know what happened to him, but he went away sad because he was very wealthy. Uh, so he was obviously putting a lot of value on worldly goods. We don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. All that stuff has no value. Not in the long run. So, when I was looking at this lesson, uh, uh, in Philippians, I was thinking about, well, what's on your trophy wall or what's on my trophy wall? What are we willing to give up? Something that we can only answer, you know? What are we willing to give up? So where do we place our value? What parts of the flesh do we boast about? The answer should be none. Paul used his advantage, every advantage he could to further the gospel. This is where he finds his identity. That's his trophy now. You know, and when I, when I was pondering that who Paul was, and he just laid out all of his worldly credentials in this passage of Scripture. When he laid all that out, and then I think, the, uh, then I look at the life that he's living now, that Damascus Road experience was dramatic. And why would God choose someone to carry the gospel to the unbelieving world like Paul, who was already persecuting Christians? Have you ever thought about that? He was the persecutor, and God 
turns him into the man that's carrying the gospel to the world. You know, he could already pick, God could have picked somebody who was already doing that and just uh, helped him to do it better or whatever. But no, he picked the most just polar opposite person to carry the gospel. That's a God thing right there. And for Paul to go from that life that he had before to this life, that Damascus Road experience must have been just, I I can't even tell you. We'll know someday. We'll ask him, you know. Uh, But yeah, yeah. This is what we need to get from this. In finding our identity in Christ, these other things do not cease to exist. They simply no longer define who you are. Okay? They don't define you anymore as a believer, as a child of God. It's a process. It's a process that we go through, not an event. It's a process. Verse 7 and 8. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Did you get that? Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. This is what Miss Pat was singing about earlier. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of, of how many things? All things. And count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul saying, I'm not only willing to give up everything to know Christ, he says, I'm willing to give up my life. And that's everything, okay? Not just all my, uh, everything in this world, but actually my life as well. As well. He's willing to die. And he, he mentions that when we talked about it back in chapter 1. Uh, when when we talked about to live as Christ and to die as gain. Y'all remember that? He thought it was even better that if he could die, but uh, uh, he was willing to stay because the Lord continued to want him to stay. Uh, Jim Elliott said this. He said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. We talked about that before. That makes perfect sense. Y'all get that? Did y'all write it down a couple of weeks ago when we went through that? (laughs) He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. We're not staying here. We're not staying here on this earth. You know, like I talked about before, some of us have a pretty narrow window uh, as we get older. But nobody's guaranteed tomorrow. I was talking to my wife earlier, and uh, she was telling me that a uh, person that at, uh, at our old church that uh, we used to attend, uh, she was 28. She was 28 years old. Got killed this week in a car crash. She had a little little baby, and every, the baby's fine. But 28 years old, you're not thinking about dying. You know, uh, but it happens, and it happens a lot, and we don't hear about it a lot. We don't hear about it unless we know them, you know, unless we see it on the news or whatever. But <clears throat> this life is very temporary. We're just here for a little bit. Uh, James says we're a vapor. Well, how long does a vapor last? Not very long. So knowing Christ is everything. Paul says he considers all that other stuff as dung or rubbish, right? No value to him. Doesn't doesn't matter. Wouldn't we be foolish not to follow Paul's lead on this when you think about it? He's telling us what we need to place value on and what we don't need to place value on. He's lived it. He's written about it. For us to just say, ah, he's got it wrong. Wouldn't that be foolish? No, we need to do that thing. We need to be about that thing and not be uh, living for the world anymore if that's what we're about right now. Jesus talked about this as well. He said in Matthew 6, 
verse 19. Do not lay up for yourself treasure on this earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. The stuff that he's talking about, the stuff that we own, like material stuff. He says, don't don't accumulate that unto yourself because that stuff doesn't matter. It really, really doesn't matter. Uh, Jesus didn't even have a place to lay his head. He didn't have a mortgage. He didn't have a, a rent house or nothing. Uh, he just uh, traveled around from place to place. We don't need all that other stuff. It's a burden. I'd love sometimes, and, and my wife would disagree with me, but if someone just accidentally threw a match into my attic and burned up all that stuff that I've been reluctant to take down and clear out for the last, that wouldn't hurt my feelings at all. <laughs> it wouldn't hurt. There's stuff up there. You walk in, it looks like a thrift store or something, you know. It's like, what is all this junk and who put it here? Well, we did over years and years, you know. Uh, but I don't care about it at all, but I'm sure she thinks maybe there's some hidden treasure in there somewhere. But uh, no, that stuff doesn't matter. doesn't matter a bit. Verse 9 through 11, and I'll close. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his suffering, become like him in death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So Paul is contrasting righteousness that comes of your own, that comes that's your own, or righteousness that comes through faith in Christ. The one righteousness is what people try to earn by keeping the law and those types of things, and that righteousness is worthless. Jesus said it's as filthy rags. It has no, no value whatsoever. So that leaves only one other righteousness, and that's the righteousness that God uh, gives you through your faith in him. And that's the only righteousness that matters. And uh, guess what? We can't do that on our own. Otherwise, it would be a works-based salvation, right? We can't. There's a lot of religions now that are based on works-based religions where they have to climb this ladder. You go, okay, I accomplish this, now I go to the next level. Now I've accomplished this, now I go to the next level, uh, <clears throat> only to find that it's meaningless and worthless, and it's a false religion. But Paul's saying that he has the righteousness that, from God that depends on faith, and in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and share in the suffering, becoming like him in death. So he knows what's ahead for him, and we do too, because we've read ahead in the scripture. We know what happens to Paul. He spends the rest of his life serving the Lord as best as he can, uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit, touching millions of lives uh, with the gospel and then God, uh, well, then Nero uh, has him killed. Uh, so you think, wow, what kind of life was that? That was the best life. That was the best life a person could possibly have. There is no better, okay? Paul never quit. He never quit on God. That's why I was saying earlier that Damascus Road experience must have been just unbelievable. Because never, ever, never in the scripture do you hear uh, Paul say, you know what, I'm going to give this up. This is just too hard. You know, I can't do this anymore. I've been whipped 50 times, stoned, beat, beaten with rods, imprisoned, and, and bitten with snakes. And I mean, the list goes on. Stoned, left for dead. But did he ever say, you know what, I'm just going to go back to what I was doing before, making some tents and things and and I hang out with the, with the guys and stuff. No. So let him be a lesson for us. We need to be like Paul who is being like Jesus. Okay? Uh, 
What else? What else is there? What else is there in this world? It's all emptiness. It's all emptiness. Let's pray. Father, uh, I thank you for showing us things, Lord, and helping us to learn. I thank you for giving us insight on, into what made Paul tick, which was you, Lord God. Lord, help us to have that as well, Lord. Help us to have that burning desire, Lord, uh, to be a servant to you and nothing else, Lord, because we already know the world can give us nothing. It's all worldly and doesn't mean anything. The only thing that means anything in our life, Lord, is knowing you and the power of your resurrection in our lives. Lord, that's the direction that we want to go. Lord, help us. Enable us by your spirit to be those people. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please rise as we uh, close out our service. Thank you.